It has been four weeks, a month now, since we have been in our study of the Bible series uh, three weeks ago. Uh, we had a, a smaller group here, and whenever we have a smaller group, uh, I usually leave it open to uh, if anyone wants to have a Q&A, and not off the running question list, but just kind of um, any question that, that uh, the saints might have. And so we had a, small, a smaller group that night, uh, and eventually we actually ended up having a, a kind of a, a bigger group <laughs> when everyone got here. Um, but... Uh, and so we weren't in it then, and then I was gone. Brother Cody took over uh, for those two weeks, and now we're getting back into it. But we are in our Study of the Bible series. The goal of this series is to do an, an, a number of things. One is to magnify the Word of God, to have you see what the Scripture testifies of itself in connection with what God's Word is and the excellency of the power that it is. Um, it also is designed to teach you how that works with how, man, how God made man, how God has made us. Uh, he has made us to bear his mind and his heart. And when God made man, he did not make man with all knowledge, but rather with the capacity to receive his knowledge, to receive his mind, his thoughts, his heart, his attitude, uh, yea, even his emotions. And um, that is what he gets accomplished with the written word of God uh, today. And um, that's kind of where we're at now. And we're looking at now the necessities of study. That's where this whole series, where I want to go with it, and that's where we're headed toward, is to get some principles of study. I want to give you some tools and some principles that when you open God's Word of what you're looking for and, and how to utilize them and, and how to see relationships between propositions and uh, a lot of things that we haven't gotten into yet, but yet are setting the, the, uh, the framework for. And um, so before we get to that point, which will be the bulk of this series, uh, we're looking at the necessities of study. I hope to wrap that up tonight, uh, although we might not be able to get it accomplished in connection with some review I want to have. Uh, but in the next two weeks, we get that accomplished, and then we move, what I want to move on into is to show you kind of the other side of looking at what we looked at before in regards to God's word being the excellency of his power. Um, again, there's a lot of power of God's power uh, uh, manifest to us in the scriptures. The splitting of the Red Seas, the, the miracle signs and wonders that Christ did when he was on earth. You had all those other, other signs that were done with Daniel in the lion's den and, and uh, the, the list can go on and on and on. But the excellency of his power is what he is doing today in the dispensation of God's grace in which we live. And that is, he is manifesting the power of his word because it is his word that carries and transfers his spirit, not the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit is the one that does it, but his spirit, his, the lowercase s, the mind of God, his thoughts, his intents, his reasoning, his purpose, his logic, his, 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 and, 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 and all the things that that makes up. That's what the Word of God communicates. So we're going to look at the flip side of that once we get done with these necessities. And what I mean by that, the flip side of looking at the excellency of His power is that what does it communicate to us? And obviously, you, could, you spend the whole time in, 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 in church and reading to learn what it is that He's communicating to man. And so we're going to look at some specific things that God's Word communicates to us. His love not in, only in regards to the, the work of the cross and the manifestation and the commendation of his love towards sinners in the cross work, but we're going to look at his much more love. And not only that, but his love put in instruction form. And that's important because when he puts his love in instruction form, that gives you and I the capacity to love like he loves. It's one thing to see the cross and, and to be moved and propelled by the cross, which it does do that. Please don't get me wrong. It does do that. But to have words that generate in you the same type of love that moved him to die on that cross, that's what, that's what we're going to be looking into. Uh, we're going to look at God's comfort, how it is that he comforts. It's through the words of God that he gives you the comfort. Uh, Paul teaches in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 that he is the father of mercies and the God of 
all comfort. Not just 50%, not just 90% of the comfort that you could ever receive. All the comfort you ever and ever will need is in this book. It may not be the comfort that you think you need, and therefore there's a renewing of the mind that goes on, but it's all the comfort you need in every situation and circumstance. In fact, when Paul talks about that shortly thereafter, when he magnifies God as being such, as the God of all comfort. And by the way, you only need comfort when you're in a predicament. When you're in a position, you're in, 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 you're, you're in a situation, a circumstance that needs some support and encouraging and some hope. It's only those times when you need comfort. If, if you're in a position that everything is handy, you don't necessarily need comfort. But yet he's the God of all comfort. And he knows that we're going to suffer. We're going to go through persecutions, afflictions, tribulations, stress, distress, all these kind of things. And he's the one that can comfort us in it all. But shortly thereafter, when Paul says that, Paul, was, he, he, gets, he testifies to a time when he was pressed out of measure. He was above strength. The capacity that he had, as well as the capacity that God's word provided him up until that point, he was pressed out of it. He was, it was, the situation was above all that, above to where he could bear. Yet he says that he was in that situation, that he would trust in the God who raises, from, raises him from the dead, that would raise him from the dead. He, Paul was thinking that he was going to die not just a natural death, a death at the hands of those that were persecuting him. And he comes along and he says that he got comfort in that from God. And the comfort was that he would be raised from the dead. Not that he would be delivered from it, but that he would be raised from the dead. And that comforted Paul's spirit and his, and his soul. So that's another thing that we'll look at in connection when we look at uh, specific things that God were done. Uh, we'll look at hope uh, we'll look at strength, and, and uh, we'll look at, it provides us armor. Uh, it does a whole bunch of things for us, and we'll just get a taste of that. And then we'll eventually move into the principles of study, and I'll utilize uh, this technology a little bit more and kind of interacting with the text and being able to identify words. I, we won't go to, I won't give you a grammar lesson, because by no means am I a grammarian, an English grammarian, but... We'll rehash some of that. Maybe we'll take a lesson to talk about adjectives and, and nouns and pronouns just to be able to get your mind thinking about when you come to a word, what, is that, what does that mean? What is, it trying to, what is it communicating? What is its intent? Why is it there? And then once you're able to grasp that word and how it's connected with another word and how you get all, therefore, these connections and now you can understand a verse and now you can take that understanding to the next verse, and, and study God's word and get out of it God's mind because that's what he wants uh, to give us and that's what his word does uh, for us. So with that being said, that's kind of where we were, that's, kinda, that's where we are and where we, will, we are headed. And um, again, we left off talking about these necessities of study. Pop quiz, does anyone remember the necessities of study uh, that we've covered thus far or, and or all of the necessities of study? There was three major ones. We talked about four, but three that followed that, that kind of the bulk of, of what we want to talk about. Does anyone remember one or any of them? You didn't think I was going to ask, give you a pop quiz tonight, did you? He's got back, and he's in, a, he's in a rhythm now, and he's giving us a pop quiz. I shouldn't have showed up tonight. No, Second Timothy 2. Second Timothy 2, yeah. <laughs> what specific? Well, 15, of course. Yep. Study to show thyself approved. A workman that needed not to be ashamed. Rightly divide the word of truth. What does it take uh, to be a workman? Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, one of them was diligence. The first one was... If you want to study God's word and get out of it what you're supposed to get out of it, you first need the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit. Uh, you need to be a believer. 
uh, because the things that you study are spiritually discerned. They are spiritual. And in order for you to have the, the proper mindset and approach to God's word, you at least have to have, the, have met God in regards to knowing him and those type of things to the point where he tells you where, where your relationship with him starts. And that is in connection with the spirit communicating the gospel of Christ, the gospel of the grace of God. How that Christ died for your sins, was buried, and rose again. If your heart has responded positively by faith and faith alone to that message, there is a connection, there is a, a point where you have esteemed that gospel to the point that you believed it, and you therefore now have the Spirit of God. There is that spiritual conception that takes place, the seed of God's Word impacting a soft heart, a heart that has been moved somewhat and, and believed by that gospel, and now there is a, a, a spiritual birth, a regeneration, Paul says in, in Titus chapter 3, that has taken place. You are a child of God, and you are justified unto eternal life. You have the Spirit of God. And it is in that, it is in the fact of, of the gospel of Christ uh, making impact upon your mind and heart to the point where you believe, it's that process that continues on. And if you don't have that initial implanting of, of, of the Spirit and, and appreciation of the fundamental truth, how that Christ died for your sins, was buried and rose again because the wrath of God is against your unrighteousness, ungodliness, then the rest of it, just forget about it. Because when he talks about the heavenly places and the glory, you're not going to care if you don't care about the cross. The, the, the hope, you don't, you don't have a hope if you don't care about the cross. And so that's God's starting point. That's when he gives you the spirit of God. And if he's given you the spirit of God, it's because you have, you have believed that gospel. And now is the issue of keep going with that. So the first thing was, you need to be a believer. You need to have the Spirit of God. He's the one that teaches. And also, if you have the Spirit of God, it's an indication of how you're able to, how you have, and how you're able to respond to God's Word uh, from that point forward. The second thing was, is that you have to have a desire. If you don't have a desire, you're not going to do something. Whatever it is. This is not only true in, in regards to God's Word, it's true in, in everything. Uh, they always might talk about that when you find a job, find a job, do a job that you what? That you like, that you love. Because otherwise it's just going to get really, really tough on you eventually. That's, that's essentially anything. You don't do the things that you don't desire, you don't like. Uh, Abigail, we come and you think that, oh, we're going to play games in CBC. Right now she just doesn't have a... Have a, have a desire for it. So it's cultivating that desire. And once that takes place, just like we had to do it to get her in the back there, now she wants, to, she wants to go back there. It's not a fight to get her back there now. Um, you know, you can, you can go on with examples. Well, the same goes for God's word. In fact, that, that, that principle that I just spoken about, that's there because of how God has made us. He's made us as a creature with a, that, that is able to make a choice. And we make choices based upon the value we see in something. And when we see the value in it, we desire it. And so we, if, you, if you want to study and get out of it, I'm not saying you can't get anything out of God's Word if you don't desire and you just read it and pick some things up. You can do that. But we're talking about getting some Thick, deep understanding. Some appreciation is you got to have a, have a desire. And God's word is also the source to produce that desire in you. And it perpetuates itself. It, it is life itself. The, second, the third thing, I should say, is the necessity of study is to be prayerful. When you study God's word, it's not just the issue of Laying and going one ear and out the other, reading it, study actually, you're engaged in it, your mind's engaged in it. And that's a, the essential, one of the essential things of study is that you're engaged. That's, that's prayer. Is that you're communicating. What, is this, what does this mean? 
Father, what, what are you trying to, to, to teach me here? Here's, you use the word righteousness here. What's righteous? That's prayer. We don't think of prayer like that, but that's prayer. That's prayer at its, at, at its, truest, uh, 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 at its truest form is talking and relating to God in connection with his word. So being prayerful. Uh, and the last thing is diligence. A desire, being prayerful, and being diligent. Uh, the best example I can give just off the top of my head and before we get into things is that there's always work to be done. Uh, and oftentimes we don't have a desire for something you usually aren't too diligent in it. But if you have that desire and that desire to the point where you're going to engage in it, there's going uh, to be a measure of diligence there. And when you have that necessity in regards to studying, you will, and spent all three of those, all four of them, you will be fruitful in your understanding when it comes to God's word. You will. And in, each, in the last three, the issue of desire, being prayerful, and being diligent, there is room for each of those to grow. It's one thing just possess them and, and, and take that with you when you go to study, but there is room to grow in each and every one of those. And therefore, what you give of yourself to those things, the more you'll get. The more you'll get. And um, that's, a, that's a fantastic prospect. The more you apply yourself, your mind and your heart and your time to God's word, the more you'll get out of it. And you remember, what God's word is communicating is his mind and his heart. And therefore, the more time that you involve yourself in God's word, the more of him you get. He is a rewarder, the writer of Hebrews says, and it's a principal truth throughout all of scripture. He is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. And the first component of that reward is you get to know him. You get to know him. And that's essentially, ultimately, the ultimate reward. Well, let's get into it. Um, we left off, we dealt with desire, and we're moving in now to being, in regards to being prayerful. Uh, again, God's desire for man is to know the word and live the word. But to know the word, especially to the measure God has given it, is the foundation of its instructions to read and study it. Therefore, there are two sides, God's provision of his word and uh, and man's responsibility to that word. So the two, two, two issues. The provision of his word and our responsibility in connection with his word. It says one of God's purposes uh, with us is to give us his mind and heart by his word and giving us his spirit. Uh, he has a great desire and diligence to give it to us and therefore we should match that desire and diligence. Uh, if we can match it, I should say. Uh, his, his desire, you always want the one who's leading you to have a, 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 a deeper measure of desire than you do. Uh, because he's the one leading, and he does. He always will. But nevertheless, we should have a desire and a diligence to that end as well. Man's responsibility is to learn from him. May, uh, may not match his. However, man should have a great desire for his word to learn it and be diligent in, their, in our reading and studying of it. With such desire and diligence provides the environment for spiritual understanding and to receive the deep things of God. And again, we will get into now being prayerful. That was all review, so let me get into reading our kind of our text here, and I'll pray, and then we'll get into um, the, the, our study here this evening. I'm going to read Acts 17, verses 10 through 11. And I want you to see, although they might not be listed... See that they're part and parcel of these verses in regards to desire, being prayerful and diligent. See that these saints at Berea were that. Acts 17 verse 10, And the, and the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night in, unto Berea, who coming thither went into the synagogue of the Jews. These, those that were in Berea, were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched 
the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time to get into your word and to see what your word says of itself and to see these, these features that we ought to possess. They ought to be hallmark features that characterize uh, our lives, especially in connection when we open up this book that is a window that through it we see and we come to understand with the eyes of our understanding who you are, your mind and your heart, the things that, that move you to decide certain things and, and move you to do uh, certain things. We gain access to that uh, through your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and the Spirit that you've given us, and the great work that he has involved himself in through man to write your words down on a page and in a book that we can come to read. And when we get it, get all of, of your mind and heart that you desire for us to have. So we thank you for this privilege, and we thank you that we can participate in that operation at this moment. It's in Christ's name we do pray. Amen. So I, want to, I just want to show you this quickly uh, in regards to this text. It's a common verse that we know here at Twin Cities Grace Fellowship in connection with, we always want to be Bereans. We talk about being Bereans. But oftentimes when you come, at, at, at least uh, my personal testimony, and I also know of, of some that this is the point, and hopefully it's not the case for all of us, is that when we come to know the right division of God's word, that, that there was a program with the nation of Israel in time past, uh, a nation that he formed to be the entity in which he's going to utilize in the future to reconcile the earth unto himself. And that, although there's similarities to what God's doing now, there's differences as well. And therefore, we need to rightly divide those differences to what God's doing today with us as members of the church, the body of Christ. Uh, when he raised up Saul of Tarsus and, and made him Paul and gave him a, a gospel and a ministry and a message that, that through that ministry and message forms the the, the church, the body of Christ, the entity not to reconcile the earth, but the et entity to reconcile the heavenly places. And God needs to reconcile both because the adversary, Lucifer, when he fell, he first corrupted and usurped the heavenly places. And then that corruption trickled down into the earth when he usurped the monarchy, from, uh, uh, the, the monarchy of the earth from Adam there. And God's in the business of, of reconciling all things unto himself by the cross work. And he, by the mouth of all his holy prophets through prophecy may known how he's going to do that in the earth but he didn't make known how he was going to do it in connection with the heavenly places until he revealed that to the apostle paul the apostle to the gentiles through israel's fall once we come to know that and that and that truth oftentimes we come along and there is this tendency not 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 all the time don't get me wrong but is that I'm a Berean. I've come to this knowledge. I've come to this understanding. And that's kind of it. I've arrived, as it were. And our nobility that characterizes us to get us to that understanding kind of falls by the wayside. And that readiness of mind isn't there. Paul's our apostle. That We're the members of the church, the body of Christ. We know that. And that's different from the nation of Israel Yes. And that, the, the leading question is, well, what's in Paul's epistles? What does he teach? And in that, we still need that nobility and that readiness of mind that when we open up Paul's epistles, that we have that same feature just as we got to, to, to be, to come to that understanding. And so this is true, this, this feature ought to persist in us, in that nobility of heart and that nobility of, of mind. Look what he says here he, in verse 11. He says, these, these in Berea were more noble. So he says, then those in Thessalonica. So he just comes from Thessalonica. Were those in Thessalonica noble? Yes. Yeah. When you have the words there, these were more noble. That indicates that the ones there in Thessalonica, they were noble. They, they, they searched the scripture. They had a readiness of mind. But the measure of it, of the saints at Berea, was greater. 
because that's what's recorded of them. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica. In fact, the, th the saints at Thessalonia and the Thessalonian epistles, we often characterize them and talk about them in 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians as mature believers. That man, they, 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 received, they received the word of God and you don't see much, much uh, correction with the Thessalonians. It was the issue of the, the rapture that they kind of got uh, duped by and victimized by and those type of things. But as far as their conduct and behavior, they, they, they knew about brotherly love and, and abounding in love toward one another. Paul just has to tell them, abound more and more. But they were, they were mature but these ones at Berea were more noble than even those at Thessalonica. And, 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 and how does Paul talk about that? That's what, after this comma, that's what he's going to say. In that. Here's this, this more nobility is in that. And here's how he's going to define it. They what? Received. received. There's, there's number one. They received the word, and then he's going to describe the action of their receiving. They received the word with some? All. All readiness of mind. They had a desire for it. I don't know if you remember. Let's go back there. Turn back there with me to Proverbs chapter 2. One of the passages where we saw all, and again, these, these, these features and these necessities of study are true from beginning to end in the scripture. And I described that there are some passages in God's word where you'll, you'll find all three of them. The desire, the, be, the, the prayer, and the, and the diligence. Proverbs chapter 2 is one of those passages. And look at what he says here uh, in verse 1. He says, My son, if thou wilt receive my what? Word. So you see the connection there. They received the word. It says, verse 1, My son, if thou wilt receive my words and hide my commandments with thee, so that thou incline thine ear unto wisdom. All readiness of mind. How do things get in the mind through the what? Ear. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a parallel description of the same action, as it were. It was, it's, it's the incline your ear. He says, unto wisdom. And then he says, and apply thine heart to understanding. That's what it means to receive the word with all readiness of mind. They're ready for it. Give it to me, Paul. Give it to me. I want to hear it. I'm going to incline my ear into you. You don't have to worry about this going in one ear and out the other. You don't have to worry of, of me not, not hearing something. Because boy, I'm, they're on the edge of their seats. Give it to me. Feed me. Give it to me. In this case, it's the issue of, Paul, what do you have to say? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to listen, and then they're going to do something else. Receive the word with all readiness of mind. Back to Acts 17, verse 11. This and, so there's your additional or on top of, Number two, they what? Searched the what? The scriptures. the scriptures once a week. That's how you start to study. That's how you start to think about the impact of what this is saying is by contrasting it to what it's not saying. It doesn't say that they met Sundays. And... Uh, it, they just got together Sunday and then they came back the next Sunday. I'm not saying that's wrong or anything, anything bad about that. But when Paul taught them these things, they went to the scriptures and they searched them daily. They were in God's word. Paul, this is what you've said. We're all readiness of mind. We're here what you're saying. Okay, let's go to the God's word and let's see if this, this actually rings true. And they were searching the scriptures daily whether those things, the things that Paul was teaching them, were so. And then I love verse 12, and we didn't even read it. Therefore, many of them, what? Believed. So the nobility feature is that 
You receive the word with all readiness of mind. You attend to it. You apply your heart to it. You incline your ear to it. And you ser- and, and search the scriptures daily whether those things are so. That's, that's what's involved in study. And if you jump down, if you go back to Proverbs 2, in verse 3, says, yea, if thou criest after knowledge and liftest up thy voice for understanding, there's the, the, the issue of prayer. And in verse 4, if thou seekest her as silver and what? Searchest. Searchest for her as for hid treasures. You're searching for something. You don't just search the search. We were in California and on the beach. The guy had the, the metal detector down there. He's, he's searching. He's not out there just having this goofy device and Wants people, I mean, he looks really goofy. And, and, and he got, oh, he's searching for something. He's searching for hid treasures. And that's what we are to do with God's word. And boy, oh boy, I remember one time, I forget who had it, who I knew who had one, and we were doing that. And beep, 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 it starts going off. What is it? And even when it's something that small, you didn't find gold. But you found something so small, but because... This device picked it up. It was below the dirt. And you went in. You're involved in searching it out. And you're down digging in there. And you finally got to it. And it's there. It's it's right there. And you grab it. No matter what it is, it's kind of a neat experience. Well, when you come to gain a treasure of knowledge of God's word, there's nothing like it. There's nothing like it. Because the value of it, as he goes on later in chapter 3 to describe the merchandise of it is better than the merchandise of silver and the gain thereof than fine gold. She, the wisdom and the treasure of knowledge of God's word, she is more precious than rubies. And all the things thou canst desire are not to be compared under her. Proverbs 3, 13, 14, 15. There's nothing of greater value than what you find by your searching in God's word. There's nothing of greater value. Because of the one who wrote it and the one who's behind it. It's of eternal value. Well, come with me. Uh, We are just here in Proverbs 2, verse 3. Look again at verse 3. It says, Yea, if thou criest after knowledge, and liftest up thy voice for understanding. There, there's an engagement. You're, You're interacting. You're requesting and supplicating unto God for knowledge and understanding. By the way, especially as a son and daughter of God today in this dispensation of grace, one who has benefited from the spiritual things in the New Testament, even though we're not under it, we benefit from it. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 3, he's an able minister of the New Testament, and that is the ministry of the leading of the Holy Spirit. That is his teaching ministry. We've benefited from that. And also some things that he teaches us are, weren't revealed before Paul's time, and are now all revealed, we have access to his leading teaching ministry. And one of the things that, uh, that our prayer is involved in is requesting and, 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 and supplicating for knowledge and understanding. And when we pray and we request for the knowledge, it's not that we don't know where to find it. Because we know where to find it. It's not out in, it's, it's, it's not in the ground it's not far out, uh, uh, out in the heavens, apart from God. It's in God, and He has communicated to you in the book. And so you know where to go to get the answer to your prayer of needing to know something. It's in here. That's one of the unique features of Paul's epistles, is that he'll pray And then later on, he'll answer the prayer. Or he'll know the answer to his prayers. We always talk about unanswered prayer. We need to talk about answered prayer. And knowing the answer to your prayer before you even pray it. We don't talk about prayer that way. That might be a foreign concept. But he already knows it. And and, and that's through his maturity in God's word, he knows it. He, he asked the saints of Ephesus to pray for him that he may, he, may, he, he may preach, that door might be opened, that he might preach boldly. 
And he says, as I ought to speak. Why would you pray for something that you already know you should be doing? Answering that question helps you to come to understand what prayer really is. Prayer is not to, God, to have God move for you. Prayer is for us. For us to move on God's behalf. Prayer is engaging in God's word so that it moves you. And when Paul's praying, he's not praying so that, well, hopefully this comes true one day, that if enough people pray, it'll happen. No, he's praying for things that he already knows the answer to. Why? So that when he comes to that point, when he preaches the gospel, it's on his mind. And he knows others are praying for him so that in that moment he would be emboldened to open his mouth and speak. It's a means to fortify what he already knows. Anyways, but prayer is part and parcel of, of coming to know God's word. It's an engagement with God's word. Come with me to Psalm chapter 1. Psalm chapter 1. When we study, it's not a mindless activity. It's an activity that engages our mind. Prayer is the means in which to communicate and make sense of things that you are studying. And how, as well, how they relate to other things. And prayer is one of the ways that that gets done. Look at Psalm chapter, uh, the first Psalm, chapter 1. Look at verse 1. 1 and 2. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the ways of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law doth he, what? Meditate, Meditate what? When? Day and night. Meditation is a further developing concept upon prayer. Because one of the ways in which you can pray is, is, is meditation. There's, other, there's, there's intercessions and, and other aspects of prayer. But when it comes to study, when it comes to gaining some knowledge, meditation is, the, is, is what, uh, what takes on the form of, of, of prayer, or the form of prayer takes on the, or prayer takes on the form of meditation. There we go. And you see this with the psalmist, and you th see this with, all throughout Scripture. Is the issue of meditation. And meditation is not some Eastern mysticism where you're trying to reach the state of emptiness. That's completely counter Bible. That's completely counter what the Spirit wants to do. Paul talks about that we might that we would be filled with the Spirit. And being filled with the Spirit, the, the sister epistle of Ephesians is Colossians tells you to have to let the Word of God dwell richly in you with all wisdom, in all wisdom. When you're filled with the Spirit, the, you're, you're dwelling, when you're dwelling on the Word of God, you're, being, you're filled with the Spirit. It's, it's as simple as that. But you're filled, therefore, with the Word of God. It's not an emptiness, but rather it's a filling. It's a taking into your mind, calling the remembrance, bringing everything that when you have a thought, that you're bringing everything that else that you know come to bear on that thought and see how it relates and engage in it and see the usefulness of it. That's what meditation is. The image of meditation is, is, is a cow is the cow chewing the cud. We were in California, we went to the zoo and went to the wild animal park and I love animals and you have, the, you have some of the animals there that they would chew the cud. And you drive by them and you walk by them later and they're still... It's like they're chewing that thing all day long. That's what the Word of God ought to be to us. We, are, we already have talked about how the Word of God is life. And we talked about it in connection with it, that, that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. That we ought to feast, not diet, but feast upon God's word. You can never 
be addicted too much to God's word. You can never want it enough. You can, you can, you just, that ought to grow and grow and grow. And that's hand in, that goes hand in hand with meditate and, and prayer is that you're engaging it in your mind throughout the day, day and night. And you see this in the Lord's earthly ministry. In the morning, he's in the mountains. At night, he's in the, he's in the mountain. He's praying. And you pray all, all night sometimes if, if, need, if, if need be. And, he's, and you know what he's doing? He's just talking with his father. A lot of that you don't, you don't quite... You, there are only a few occasions where you see what, actually what he's prayed. Well, what would you pray for all night long? What would you pray about? You have to have a lot to talk about. Well, he did. He just spent the whole day, essentially, out from, he's, he's praying, but he's, he's doing things that the Father has told him. And then he comes back at night, and he's, he's communicating that, how it went, and what's, got, what's coming next. And he's engaging with the Word of God, the prophecies that he's got to fulfill, the places that he's got to go, because every step he goes is prophetic. Every place he goes, and the next place is all in line, the timing is fitting, where he's at in his earthly ministry, all these things, and the next miracle that he does, and, and the healings that he's got to continue to perpetuate as signs of the kingdom, all these things that the Scripture has foretold that he was going to do, he's doing. He's doing. And prayer is one of the best organizers of time. It's one of the best ways to prioritize. It's to sit down and think about, in light of God's word, your day, and what's of importance, what you've got to do, decisions you've got to make, how you want to make those in connection with God's word. And again, in regards to coming to an understanding, a study, it involves our mind. Come with me to Psalm 63. Psalm 63. Psalm of David, you see the superscription there, when he was in the wilderness of Ju Judah. Verse 1, O God, thou art my God, early will I, what? Seek thee. My soul thirsteth for thee, my flesh longeth for thee in a dry and thirsty land where no water is, to see thy power and thy glory so as I have seen thee in the sanctuary. David was in the sanctuary, now he's in the wilderness. Because thy loving kindness is better than life, my lips shall what? Praise thee. Here he has a characteristic of God, a feature of God's love, his loving kindness, and because of that he engages in, a, in, a, in, a, in, 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 a, in, in prayer of, of a praising of God. Verse 4, Thus will I bless thee while I live, I will lift up my hands in thy name. My soul shall be satisfied as with marrow, uh, shall be satisfied as with marrow and fatness, and my mouth shall praise thee with joyful lips when I remember thee upon my bed and meditate on thee in the night watches. He's going to remember. That's part of prayer, praising with joyful lips. That's part of prayer in connection with all the things that God has done in connection with His name. And for his name. Look at Psalm 77. Psalm 77. Look at verse 1. I cried unto God with my voice, even unto God with my voice. And he gave ear unto me. So he's, he's praying. He's, he's crying unto God with his, with his voice. Verse 2. In the day of my trouble I sought the Lord. My sore, my sore ran in the night and ceased not. My soul refused to be comforted. I remembered God and was troubled. I complained and my spirit was overwhelmed. Selah. Thou holdest mine eyes waking. I am so troubled that I cannot speak. I have considered the days of old, the years of ancient times. I call to remembrance my song in the night. I commune with mine own heart. You know what he's doing? This, this psalm all about, all about uh, uh, prayer. 
and, and what, the, what Asaph is doing. And he calls to remembrance, and he communes with his own heart. He says, and my spirit made diligent search. He's examining himself. Will the Lord cast off forever, and will he be favorable no more? Is his mercy clean gone forever? Doth his promise fail forevermore? Hath God forgotten to be gracious? Hath he, in, hath he in anger shut up his tender mercies? Selah. And I said, this is my infirmity. But I'll remember the years of the right hand of the Most High. I'll remember the works of the Lord. Surely I will remember thy wonders of old. Asaph is going through a time where it was legitimate in one sense for him to ask all these questions. God had done some wonderful works. Now some, there's some time during, with Asaph, and those things aren't there. So he's questioning. He's communing with his heart, thinking about this. And what he does, instead of going off of the, of the situation and circumstance that would, that would cause him to answer these questions that God has forgotten to be gracious, he says, no, I'm going to remember on the works of old. I remember the days of, of your right hand. Verse 13, or verse 12. I will meditate also of all thy work and talk of thy doings. Thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. Who is so great a God is our God. Thou art the God that doest wonders. Thou hast declared thy strength among the people. Thou hast with thine arm redeemed thy people, the sons of Jacob and Joseph, Selah. The water saw thee, O God. The water saw thee. They were afraid. The depths also were troubled. He does the very thing that God does time and time again. He brings up the Red Sea. He remembers the Red Sea. When, the waters, when he split the waters, the waters were afraid. And things that took place, that took place prior to that and, and after that, that whole time that God always refers back to. Don't you remember when I brought you out of Egypt? And here's Asaph. Wondering if God has forgotten to be gracious. And he goes back to one of the most gracious times in history. And one of the most gracious times in history that God graciously acts corporately. Not just to an individual, but to an entire nation. He redeems and brings them out. He, and he sanctifies them. He sets them apart unto himself. And Asaph does that. And he, and it, and he starts thinking about the waters. And he describes them as such. The water saw thee, O God. The water saw thee. They were afraid. The depths also were troubled. The clouds poured out water. The skies sent out a sound. Thine arrows also went abroad. The voice of thy thunder was in the heaven. The lightnings lightened the world. The earth trembled and shook. And this took place following that. It took place at Mount Sinai there. There was a shaking and trembling, a thundering going on. And this is all again prophetic because it's going to come true once again out here. During the Lord's day of wrath. The way is in the sea and thy path in the great waters and thy footsteps are not known. Thou lettest thy people like a flock by the hand of Moses and Aaron. And Asaph remembers all that. And he brings himself through and he communes with his heart about these things. He's got some doubt. He's got some questions. And then he comes along and says, I'm not going to go off of this. I'm going to go off of what he goes off of, what he has always referred to, and he brings that up in his mind. And he lets that be the, his, his soul stability and the answer to his questions. Come with me to 1 Timothy chapter 4. In that, I just want you to see that what he's doing here is he's engaging with the Word of God. He's engaging with what he knows of God in this moment and situation in his life. He's got these questions, and what he does is he engages God, and he lets that. He, lets, he yields himself to that. And you see, you, when you just read it, you read the enthusiasm and, and, the, and his, 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 his strength that he's getting for remembering these things. And he, and he, and he starts thinking about the waters and, and, and how they were when, when God split them. They're, they're afraid. He's the one in control. God's in control. Oh, wait, he's, has he forgotten to be, be gracious? No. He's the one that did that. He's the one that led. And that begins to... Comfort him. When I say First Timothy, 
1 Timothy chapter 4. Uh, pick it up here in verse... Let's pick it up here in verse 12. Paul's writing to Timothy, a very intimate epistle. He says, Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. Till I come, give what? Attendance. Attendance. Have all readiness of mind when you're reading. Give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by prophecy with the laying on of the hands of the presbytery. What's the next word? Meditate, Meditate upon these things. The things that you're going to be reading and the things that you're going to start engaging your mind with are, are high things, and your meditation has to be up and on, upon those things. And then he says this in verse 15 after that. He says, give, give thyself. So you've got to have a desire. You've got to have a desire, because if you don't have a desire, you're not going to give yourself. You're not going to apply your heart to understanding anything. That you don't give yourself to. He says, give thyself. And what's that next word? That same word is over there, I believe, in 1 Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. I forget the exact verse. But when he says that, may the God of peace sanctify you wholly, your whole spirit, soul, and body. Give thyself wholly to them. To the things. The them refers to these things. And the things go back to the gift as well as, my arrow's not working, to the reading, to the exhortation, and to the doctrine. Give yourself wholly to the attending, to reading, to the exhortation, and the doctrine. He says, here's one of the reasons. Meditate upon these things. Give thyself wholly to them. That. That's a crucial word in the scriptures. That's your, that's your purpose clause. And any time you're talking about purpose, you're talking about something grand. <laughs> here's the purpose. When, when you got purpose... Something is worth something then. If you're doing something without purpose, it's just vanity. It's just empty. Who cares? You've got no purpose for it. But when you have purpose, then that gives, uh, that gives a whole lot more meaning to what he just said. So meditate upon these things. Give thyself wholly to them. Well, well, why? Why would I do this? That. Thy What? By profiting. How are you going to profit from reading in doctrine? Up here. Your profit first is not going to be seen because you're engaging in something spiritual. But you're supposed to give yourself wholly to it, not just your spirit and soul, but also your body. So those thoughts that you're getting are supposed to correlate and supposed to produce an action. When, when, when Paul says in Romans chapter 12, there in verse 2, be not, uh, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you might prove what is the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. And he says, for I, uh, I'm going to, a lot, when he says, when, the general gist is that when he says, not to think of yourself, that the grace, I beseech your brethren by the, uh, what is it? Mercy Mercy, no, that's not what I want. I'm sorry, I completely butchered. I got so excited that I lost it. For I say, through the grace given to me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God had dealt to every man the measure of faith. That thinking is not only supposed to stay there. That's supposed to come out in an, in an action. 
And some of the great liberty that we get being God's sons and daughters is that we get to prove that thinking. Here's the thinking. God will give us some information of how to, how to put in effect, but we have some liberty in being able to take that and say, this is how that will look in this situation. In this situation, this is how it would look for me not to think of myself more highly than I ought to and, and to think soberly. Think soberly in regards to that person. How would, how, would that, how would that act? How would that come out? Prove it. And so when he says here in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 15, when we meditate upon these things and give thyself wholly to them, that thy profiting may what? appear to all is that when you give yourself to these things and meditate upon them they are going to they will because you're giving yourself to it you're yielding to it you're you have a readiness of mind and you want it it will therefore grip you it therefore really will renew your mind and you'll look at those words and you'll say wow i want to Make that appear. I want to prove that. And, and God has left us in these bodies to be able to do that. When you come along, I bring up my wife because my wife is just a, a, and yes, I'm a little biased, but my wife is such a great example of, of, of godly, selfless thinking in, in, in so many things that she's done. Obviously, she's not perfect. But she, she'll, she'll do these things that I just get so astounded at. I can't believe she, I can't believe she did that. No, that's not natural. And she and you and I can be the vessel to take those things that we meditate upon and we study and we give ourselves to, be the vessel to actually do, use our hands and, 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 and frame our, our tone of voice and our attitude. Our attitudes communicated by our, 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 our body language and, and, and by how we say things. It's framed by all that. We can be a vessel to take the image of God's word to, to, to bear that image and, and prove that and, and make it appear. That's, that's, that's mind blowing. To where God comes along, and when the adversary brings his charge and all those type of things, he can come along and, and, and say, look at, look at them. Look at my sons and daughters. They're bearing my image. And the adversary looks at the one, looks at who's at the right hand of the Father, his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he looks down at us, and he starts to see not too much of a difference. Not because we're special. I'm not saying we're going, to become, we're going to be perfect, but we have godliness to think like God thinks, to, to, to conduct ourselves and, and live in uh, the way God would live and to labor with him in what he's doing, to be conformed to the image of Christ. And that, that, this, that disparity and that difference between us and the one sitting at the right hand of the Father begins to be less and less and less and less and less and less and less. And less. And it not only is in the mind, it's what we do as well. Well, the reason why I went here, uh, look at verse 16. It says, take heed unto thyself, and we've got to end, and unto the doctrine, continue in them. So continue to give attendance to it and meditate upon it. Continue in them and engaging in it and profiting and, and having your profit appear. It says, for in doing this, thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. And there's a salvation involved in this. Not salvation from the debt and penalty of your sins, but a different salvation of being victimized by the policy of evil. So meditation upon God's word is a necessity of, of study. Being prayerful is a necessity of study. And, and, and when you engage in that, out of that comes profiting of godly thinking and eventually it mature itself to godly conduct and behavior. And so again, not that you can't get a measure of this without 
engaging in prayer when you're in God's word. But there's, there's deeper measures that can be had when you do give yourself to it. When you do desire it and, and prayerfully engage and interact with the text. And that, that's going to be the thrust of this series is to teach you the, the desire thing I can't, I can't really give you besides trying to have my desire appear to you and, 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 and letting, obviously, God's word motivate you and give you a desire for God's word. I can't do that. that that's your, but what I can give you is some of these things of how to engage in the text and, and pose questions and, let, and, let, and allow the text to answer those questions and get the understanding out of it and, and, and see relationships of words and verses and, and kinds of relationships. And when a list comes up, how, how do I look at a list? How do I get some a value and worth out of this, out of this list? And, 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 and why a list? And, and, and these kind of things and give you some of that so that when you get into God's word and you, and you engage in it, well, now you're engaged in the prayer aspect of it, the meditation of it. And, and obviously you can take that throughout your day, but in regards to studying, as you're thinking about these, you're asking questions, you're, you're rereading and, and, and remembering the previous verse or reading the previous verse again and reading the next verse and, and seeing how it all fits and gain the sense of the, of the verse and the words and the passage so that it makes sense to you and it begins to grip you and you begin to then once you get it happy is the man that getteth wisdom happy is the man that getteth understanding there's joy and happiness just as much as you get that little take that metal detector and you get that little piece of metal there when you get a, a, I call them the nuggets of truth from God's word yea when you can get a big big nugget I t there's just nothing like it. I, I, you just can't compare it to anything. There's, there's nothing like it. I really like technology. I, I really like uh, many, many things. I love my wife. I love my family. And there are things that can't compare to that. But greater than it all is when I get one of those nuggets of truth. Not because, aha, I got it but because I get to see him more. I get to know him more when I get that nugget. And that's what we all should want, is to know him and the excellency of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. We'll pick it up with uh, next week with diligence, and then we'll wrap up this stage of our series and move on. Let's pray to conclude. Father, we thank you for this time to get in your word and see the these necessities of study and see the importance of them. And uh, Father, I just pray for the saints here that this wouldn't be a confusing issue, that it wouldn't be viewed as some legalistic thing, but rather all the work that we've done in your word in regards to uh, what, it, what you say about it and, and, and what our responsibility should be toward it, that these things would start to impact us and that we would uh, have that sense of responsibility when it comes to your word. Not, not just because we're Christians and we should, but because you're our Father and we want to know you more. And there's a big difference. And I pray that that spirit, that mindset, that attitude towards your word for the saints, that through the word of God, your, the spirit leading through your word uh, can produce, can effectually work in the saints through these very words and through these lessons that we're going through to begin to cultivate in them a desire for your word and that desire take itself to the next level to interact and engage with the text and take it to the next level is that you just, they just can't get enough. They're diligent. They're diligent in these things, and that's just growing and growing and growing and growing. And they just want more and more and more. And, that, and, and, and may that never cease in us. So, Father, we thank you for your word and the excellence of power that it is, and that it is the power to effectually work in those that believe. So may we believe these things as well. And most of all, we thank you for your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, how that he died for our sins, was buried and rose again. If there's someone here listening who has not trusted Christ as their all-sufficient Savior, 
May they believe in him. They died on the cross for the, for the debt and penalty of their sins. And the moment they do that, they'll be justified unto eternal life. All their sins will be forgiven, past, present, and future. Your righteousness will be imputed unto them, uh, accredited to their count. And they will therefore possess the gift of eternal life this very moment if they believe. May they believe and not let another moment pass. And Father, we thank you lastly for this time of grace giving. We don't give a tithe. We don't give in connection with the motivation of the law. We don't give grudgingly or on necessity. We give willfully and cheerfully, not just because we should, but in connection with in response to the abundant grace that you've bestowed upon us as we have learned it from your word and from the cross of your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We give in connection with that to sustain the pillar and ground of the truth here at Twin Cities Grace Fellowship and to labor with you in this ministry. It's in Christ's name we do pray. Amen.